This is an Artist Journey podcast, the podcast for people thriving and creating as artists. I'm your host, Malcolm Dewey, and let's begin. Welcome to episode 43 of an Artist Journey podcast. It's great to be talking to you again, and especially with this episode being a special one where I've got a guest from England, a super busy and talented artist who produces modern abstract art, a busy YouTube channel with amazing videos and live streams, inspiration for artists as well. So without further ado, let's meet Ed from Suarez Art. Welcome, Ed. Hello. Good day. All right, excellent. Ed, great to have you on the podcast. And for those who are not familiar with Suarez Art and or yourself and the work you do, tell us briefly about yourself and in particular what you do and where you trade. Okay, well, um, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm a professional artist. I uh, trade from uh, quite a sizable space uh, in the UK, a very, very nice part of the world uh, called the Cotswolds. And uh, I, I, my location is in a, uh, a small town called Stroud, which is a very, very good access up to the motorway network, so I can, I can reach everybody quite easily. Um, I, I've been in that place since 2012. I've had various studios since then. In that time, I've, uh, I've made it look wonderful and pretty. I'm sure we'll be able to talk about that later on. Um, and I create large, colorful, abstract paintings. That's the, the, the mainstay of what I do. I've dabbled into sculpture, other kinds of materials, things like carbon fiber, etc., etc. But 95% of everything I do is paint. It's canvas. It's as big as uh, I can manage in the studio, which is quite a big place, but still never big enough. And uh, I've built my entire business around uh, having a website. Uh, so I am a true e-commerce artist. Although I do have a physical presence, everything is driven uh, through my site. So I've deliberately set everything up in that way. And uh, it's been successful pretty much from the word go, well, from the point I decided to earn a living from it. So that's who I am. And my first name is Ed. Suarez is not my surname. It's just a name somebody gave me many, many years ago. Uh, they used to call me Eduardo Suarez. So when I was looking for an art name and I didn't take it too seriously, I thought, oh, do you know what? That'll do. Uh, and it just kind of stuck. So that's, that's where the brand name comes from. And that's why it stays as it is. But I, I am not Uruguayan and I don't play football and I don't, don't bite other players. So um, I've got no relation to the, the famous uh, footballer either. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a really cool name to have, Ed. So um, Suarez Art, fantastic. I gather that you are not always working as an artist. And I suspect you have quite an inspirational story about how you got to this point. So tell us a bit about the early days, what you did, and then your motivations for getting into art full time. Yeah, I've had the most bizarre sort of entry into it. I mean, I, I just work what I call regular jobs up until the point uh, where I discovered this in 2007. I've just been a, mainly having a retail career. I got completely uh, hacked off with that uh, and quit and then decided to have a couple of years where I just did a, a, a very a non-stressful job in the head. So I went to work as a parcel courier just to try and clear everything out in life. Thoroughly enjoyed that. And um, I stayed at that for about seven or eight years. And then um, through my martial arts academy that, that I've been a member of for, for about 20 years now, um, one of the fellow students offered me a job in his growing welding supplies business and uh, tempted me away and said, would you come and help me do my website and drive my e-commerce? And that was at a point in time, around about sort of 2006, seven. But I didn't literally even know what a website was. So I had no clue about any of it, but managed to blag my way into that, telling him I could make a difference. That's really where I got my uh, internet training, if you like. I learned the hard way in a commercial environment about what works and what doesn't. Uh, each time I learned something, I thought, right, okay, well, uh, as soon as I can, I'll use that for my own endeavors at a point in time. But uh, it wasn't until, well, yeah, 2007 and early 2008 when I actually discovered art. And then really since then, it's it's been an utter drug. And <laughs> I, I, can't, I just can't let it go since then. But it was purely by accident that I discovered it. So 
you're entirely self-taught and you just discovered this well of uh, creativity within yourself. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's the bizarrest thing. I, uh, in, in a quick 30-second resume, I uh, used to help run a ladies' self-defense class in my martial arts academy, and I was always the guy that got beat up. To, <laughs> and yet, uh, one day, the instructors decided that we weren't going to do that, and one day we were all just going to go and do some painting outside. So that essentially with 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 a a, a 20 pound note and some very basic materials i think i had three colors of paint and the tiniest canvas you've ever seen i sat out Mm -hmm. in the garden of my instructor's house and i painted for five hours and that was the very first time i ever picked up a paintbrush the first time i'd done anything outside of failing art miserably at high school Mm -hmm. and since then it's just been something i can't live a day without and it's very strange that that was the turning point, and it was purely by chance. Well, you you were into martial arts, you say, and and looking at your paintings, there's a distinct sort of Zen quality. <laughs> I don't know if that channeled through or somewhere that came out, but clearly something came out, and you haven't looked back. Getting into art full time, I think a lot of people wish they could do that and maybe are planning to do that, but it's not an easy thing to do. It is a leap into the unknown. What were your biggest challenges and some of the fears that you had to overcome? Well, you're right on everything you say. It's, it's, or can be utterly terrifying. And I think I toyed with the idea for two or three years about, could I actually do this? Could I sustain an income just purely with this? And I think that's ultimately, there is a question that needs to be answered. I think it's for every artist, um, is what do they actually want out of it? Now, if they want to be self-supportive from their craft and and just have that as their sole income, then great. If that's the focus, then there are, for me, a certain roadmap as a way to do it. However, it's going to be diff- different for everybody. The biggest challenges for me, well, well, firstly, was I needed somewhere to operate in, and I've had countless small studios in the past very low key but it was quite obvious as i started to go bigger with the work that i was never ever going to need anything except for a large space which presented its own problems you know working on a big scale is always a logistical problem so all i've basically done is just to to disassemble all of the component problem parts and put it into some kind of order where i can solve each particular one my end goal was always at some point i want to be self-sufficient but the problems really between deciding that and actually doing it come down to a decent space having enough money in reserve to give yourself a fighting chance that's a mistake i made actually because i quit my job with two months money of work to to live off so i I, that was utterly terrifying because i'd also taken on a very expensive lease for three years so i had a legal commitment on a very big old derelict building knowing full well that i couldn't afford it so that was my leap of faith I, i had such commitment in what i was doing and to be honest, I'd worked probably five and a half years up until that point and built up such a portfolio of work and a decent website and learned, learned, learned before I had to rely on it that actually come the time when I had to rely on it, I'd pretty much got everything in place. So I think if, if I was to, to say there's a lesson here, it's be prepared first before you leap. Because in actual fact, if you're well practiced at something, and I mean about learning your craft, being proficient at it, being good at it, being comfortable with it, if you can learn, if you can go over all the things that you're thinking about time and time and time again, have a plan, practice, 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 the, when the time actually comes to execute it, it actually isn't isn't a problem. I'll give you one small example, if I may. There's um, I also do climbing as well. I'm quite new to the climbing game, and... Uh, there's a famous climber called Alex Honnold, and um, he's achieved something in the climbing world that was thought utterly impossible by climbing up um, uh, a rock face in Yosemite called El Capitan. And he did that without any ropes, harnesses, literally a pair of gym, gym shoes and a rucksack on his back. And when you begin to, to well, you can see the Oscar winning film called Free Solo, blah, blah, blah. I won't go into that. But ultimately, it comes down to this. If you are practiced sufficiently at something, what you're doing each time you're doing it is eliminating the fear. So the better you become, it's like being a concert pianist. If you've only practiced for two years and suddenly you have to play in a a symphony in a massive hall, you're probably going to be utterly terrified. But if you've practiced and rehearsed and done everything you possibly can ready for that day, 
then actually when you get out there, it's a celebration of what you do. And I think when I became full time, it was a release, even though I made the mistake of not having too much money to live off. And I did take a bit of an unnecessary risk. The principle of it is at that point in time, I knew it was right. So actually it wasn't that big a gamble because I knew as soon as that Monday morning came when I was on my own, I was going to smash it. And you know what? I did. So I don't think the fear that people have in their heads is probably born, and I'm going to, I don't know if this is too controversial to say, but could very well be born out of a failure to prepare for every outcome or as many outcomes as you can. What you say is something more or less that uh, I went through as well. Also transitioning from a career where there was a, a safe income into full-time art. And as you correctly say, it, it's not something that you wake up the next day and say, I'm quitting my job and starting an artist. It's more of a transition. The hardest part was knowing when to pull the trigger. And actually, um, I think a lot of people are pr probably are ready. They just need to actually get that somebody to kick them out the airplane. Very true. Very true. Yes. Some, sometimes we do need a big kick. <laughs> Let's have a look at your art. Um, you describe your art as modern, abstract and going through your fabulous uh, gallery on your website, uh, your art's full of color, energy, vibrant. It's, it's fantastic to, to look at. Where do you think your influences come from? Um, also taking account, it is modern abstract, so it really is a, a cerebral type of thing as well. Where's this creative inspiration coming from? Do you know, I'd like to have some long, convoluted, intelligent answer, but the genuine one is I literally don't have the faintest idea. It's still a mystery to me these days. I, you know, I like colours, but I've never particularly been extravagant or flamboyant in the way that I live or, or the way that I dress or the language that I use. So where this is deep inside, I literally have no idea. And I, I struggle every day with understanding why I'm drawn to doing certain things. I, I also, you know, I know that there is no figurative representation going on in any of the work and i did deliberate don't put anything in there yes everything is an abstraction of some kind of form if it's a line it's a line if it's a shape it's a shape if it's a something else well then so be it uh, labels are a difficult thing of course they are but the, the world needs them otherwise we'd never be able to understand what a teapot was or what a jet jet airplane looks like so i do understand we need to call things by certain names for us to have some kind of understanding Modernism, I, I don't, you know what, I don't go too much into the labels of, uh, of the art establishment and movements. Um, it is difficult to classify what I do simply because it's, at its basic level, it's paint on canvas. Every, everything that is paint on canvas is, is, is exactly that. What I tend to do, um, yes. I don't know, the, the energy, I think the life can be so dull and so tedious sometimes that, that it's just nice to have a release. And running an art business and trying to not just keep it where it is, but push it and push it and push it to see what you're capable of is so hard and so difficult and takes so much resilience and determination and all those wonderful big words that we could use that the time when I can actually relax, the time when I can switch off, the time when I can actually just go, you know what, I don't care. I'm just going to do what I want to do. That's the point at which I paint. Yeah. So maybe it's just a release from the world. I don't really know. This is good. We're, we're discovering this possibly for the first time by talking about it. I don't know. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing deep there, Malcolm. There's nothing at all. It's just a celebration of colors, forms, and shapes. Call it what you want. Yeah, I, I think you've, you've spoken just like an artist should. You don't have to know where it comes from. It just just gets out there and that that is the true artist speaking so uh, i've become a psychologist <laughs> so i won't send you a boulder <laughs> okay thank you i i want to just mention one or two of your paintings that being sort of a, a landscape guy myself um i was particularly taken with uh, your painting if the wind could speak the claude monet inspired ah yes yes you discuss your paintings and how you make them in quite a bit of detail. And just tell the listeners a little bit about that painting because it's it's not just paint on that canvas. No, no, that's, that's very true. I um, it, It's a tricky one, actually, because whilst I try and keep everything fairly linear and sort of sat solely within my head, it's impossible not to be influenced by the things that we see and experience. And, you know, much as though I love the works of, 
people like Pollock and Barnett Newman and all the and and Rothko and all these kind of people, which is perfectly evident. I also enjoy you know things from Leonardo da Vinci and upwards, and I am no art expert. One of the things I really adore is the work of, of Monet. I think certain parts of his work are utterly extraordinary. And um, in my head for a couple of years, there was always a plan to do something on a grand scale. I think I'd been to Tate Modern in London and seen uh, one, one from the Water Lilies uh, collection, and it was utterly breathtaking, it was, especially the, the depth of colour and, and, and how he produced his forms. And I thought, you know, I'd love to try and do an interpretation of that. It's, it's, it's in homage too. So... Rather than just using paint on canvas, I thought, right, what, what can I do here that, that sort of pushes me as well as reinterpreting the theme in the way that I paint? So we've queued up not just trademark enamel paints. I've also put in there uh, ink. I've also got pigment mixed with resin. So there are, it's quite a bit different from the paints that I use. Um, I've also, apart from 24 karat gold and crushed diamonds, would you believe, um, I've also used uh, malachite. Now, the listeners know what malachite is, but it's a semi-precious stone. Uh, got influenced by that by a client of mine down in London uh, who collects uh, very rare vintage pieces of furniture uh, crafted from malachite. And it's this beautiful fused kind of green, uh, almost basalt kind of, of rock. It's utterly beautiful. And uh, at, at its heart, I... I think if I'm right saying it's calcium carbonate. But anyway, I managed to get malachite and I got it all crushed up and I mixed that in with some resin and that's on the painting as well. So we've got a real mishmash of different kinds of materials. So it gives it lots of textures. You know, when, when you look at the Water Lily series, especially if you can see them for real, you can see just how brilliant this man was with creating textures without the texture. It's just phenomenal. I mean, the paint is beautiful anyway, and you can't, you know, all these galleries, you can't get too close to it. But his, his depth and the way you just want to reach out and you can feel the lilies in your hands, even from 10 feet away, is just extraordinary. So, you know, as, as a comparative dumbass, what, what was I going to do to try and emulate some of the work of the great man? And um, I wanted to explore and have some fun with materials. And I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's having some fun with some new materials and just creating a kind of fusion based on that series of paintings as the inspiration. And, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Never done anything like it before. Probably never do anything like it again. But you know what? It stands up there with the rest of them. And I'm, I'm happy with that. I think it's an exceptional tribute. Uh, talking about your website and also your YouTube channel, you have a real forthright approach, an honest uh, discussion of your work. Um, and as you describe it, you as real art for real people. What made you emphasize the, let's say, the no nonsense um, approach to putting your art out there? I guess having, I mean, a lot of this comes from you could call it naivety. But when I first started this, I, I just literally started with a blank sheet of paper and thought, okay, how am I going to reach the people that really want to buy this? Well, um, I need to use digital means. I need to use the powers of the internet. And therefore, it was just a straight A to B. I no doubt there are people out there who will like this, so I need to go and find them, and I need to make everything as attractive and as easy as possible for them to find it. Most notably, that is without a middleman, or without an agent, without a dealer, and without a gallery. Now, there is a commercial reason, reason for that, and that's because I don't want to pay anybody a great big chunk of my income. That's quite a... For me, it's quite a, a hot topic in my head about, about the gallery network. We can touch on that if you want to. But ultimately, I just wanted to go direct to the people that loved it. I, I think in this day and age, we are so connected. We have so few barriers between us all that actually making things easier for someone who really wants to put something like this in their lives is the main focus for doing this. And I wanted to take all those hurdles out of the way and connect me straight to the person that says, I really like this, Ed. I've never bought anything before. What do I do next? But I really like these couple of paintings. Do you know what? I promise I will look after you and I will fill your life with something wonderful. Now, if you hand that to a third party, I believe that you start diluting that experience. Now, if someone's going to pay big ticket money or decent amount of money for a piece of art, you know, mine aren't cheap, I believe that I should be there for them i am part of their journey the painting is a if you like for want of a better word 
it's their permanent memory of that journey. Of course it is, and of the journey I did on to go to get to that point. But I want their experience to be from the second they either pick up the phone or send me an email, and then to continue beyond after the painting. And that, to me, is a life thing. I, I believe you can change your floor coverings and you can repaint your house and put extensions up. But when you buy art, your art is for life and beyond, and it gets left to whoever you want to leave it to. So I don't think, it, whilst <laughs> I can profess that I don't want it treated like a commodity, in some ways it has to be because that's the way that you can reach people. You have to reach them without all the, without all the rubbish and the fluff and the apple pie and the pretentiousness that the that the traditional system can put in its place. You know, I'm not a conceptualist. I don't have any deep-seated meaning. I want people to enjoy what I do. I want them to enjoy it on their own terms. I don't need anything heavy behind it. And there shouldn't be people stepping in, in the way of that. If somebody wants something, pick the phone up and talk to me. And I think that actually is the purest way of operating. And, and I just don't see why we have to have a way of doing that that isn't like that. And I always get so frustrated when artists come to me and say, I'm with a gallery or, you know, I see what you're doing or you should be with a the gallery. They do all the work for you. Yeah, I know galleries do the work for you. That's why you pay them the commission. But at the end of the day, don't you want to sort of meet your buyers? Don't you want to be involved with the process? I do. I personally want to be involved. I want to make their lives better. I know it's very, very righteous. But that's actually true. The, the, the taking of the money is an essential thing. But actually, at the end of the day, that's a legacy. I mean, you're changing somebody's life when you put a piece of art on the walls and they burst into tears. It, you almost can't put a price on that. And I think when you start to stick people in the way of that, it all just gets muddy. It, and people get let down and ripped off and lied to. No, go straight to the, straight to the person that created it and have a conversation. I, I can't see there's a better way of doing it than that. Well, I'm going to jump right into the issue of galleries. One of the, actually one of the first videos I watched on your YouTube channel was one about why you don't use a gallery. I watched it and, I, and it was almost like, that's exactly what I've been thinking myself. And yes, that too also <laughs> resonated with me. There were so many parts of your, what you mentioned on your YouTube video that was exactly what I'd been experiencing and, and coming across. So I'm pretty convinced it is an international issue. Um, it is something that, let's have a look at from an, the artist's point of view. The idea that you, if you land a gallery, you're pretty much set for life and everything's going to be sweet. So many artists seem to be caught up in this mindset that the gallery is going to be their saving grace and end up disappointed. From an artist's point of view, what should an artist be really looking at to secure their their business? Is it just a gallery or is it many other streams of income as well? Uh, that, that's, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Look, um, just because I personally don't think, don't like the gallery system and, uh, and think there are better ways of doing it, doesn't mean to say that it doesn't work for both collectors and buyers as well as artists and if the artists listening to this who are very happy with what they're doing fantastic do you know what great and if you're making sales couldn't be happier for you we all know though in the real world that that doesn't happen for everybody who's represented by a gallery so i think the very very important thing is is to have a backup plan now if you continue to sell with a gallery fine fantastic your choice absolutely go for it but for goodness sake, if that all stops overnight, you better be prepared for what happens afterwards. And I think if you want to run it all side by side, it's probably no bad thing if, you, if your business model can do it. But if you want to be sustainable and have an exit plan, should it all go wrong? And let's be honest with these current times with contractions in our economies, government spending, uh, people staying at home and changing their habits. There is a potential, a very real one, that a lot of galleries could be downsizing we might even see them closing. So now more than ever, I echo everything you've said, Mark. It's very important to have a, an exit strategy. For me, absolute rule number one, no matter what, will be to have a website because it is a central point at which you can point everything that you do back to the central point. That's great in principle. Over and above that, it's all right having a website and then walking away from it. 
a website is a it's it's like having a child you've got to care for it every day you've got to feed it you've got to watch it grow you cannot just have a website and then get on and leave it and just carry on with what you're doing when you commit to it you commit to it for life i i have i have to talk of it as as being a child which ultimately means if if you're doing this you've got to understand how essentially google works so yes other search uh, engines are available um, but uh, you've got to understand how people search for things, what tools are available. It's actually quite a simple thing to do. It's just a series of questions that you need to answer for yourself. How do my clients, or how do I want to be found online? How do I want to present myself? How can I make my site quicker? What is my user experience like? Uh, how do people uh, look at me when, I, when they look at my site? How are they going to find me? There's a thousand questions out there to be answered. But in actual fact, all the answers are out there. But like anything, the more practice you have at it, the better it becomes. And if, I'll just say one little caveat. If, if, if anybody gets emails from, from uh, companies try, or, 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 or online courses telling them that they can get them to page one on Google, trash it, delete it, get rid of it straight away because there isn't a single company on earth that can deliver that. Um, for lots of different reasons, but I'll just pop that in. But yes, so website absolutely has to be the hub. One really good reason for that, yeah. if you have a central hub, everything you do circumvents that. So if you're doing social media, then you've got somewhere to take people to a central point. You can point everybody to it. If you are in printed media, you can do the same. If you are doing, uh, I don't know, anything online, that's where you point people to. Even if you're with a gallery, you still can have your website because what happens when somebody wants to in your gallery that's representing you wants to send a customer away to do some more research they'll send them to to your site you know so it it has, has so many advantages to have a good decent website not something half baked but do the research do something proper and it will stand and it will be there and it will find an audience i guarantee if you do everything right you'll find your audience absolutely now on the theme of self reliance creating a website, creating your art, putting it out there. You haven't just stopped at that point. You actually make it extremely easy for them to buy your art and to get familiar with it and to decide whether it's a good fit for them. So you've added all these services onto your offering, as it were. Tell us a bit about those services that I think really distinguish what you're doing from um, anyone else. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, so I think the biggest one is that um, me and uh, my colleague Adrian, who, who works with me, my best friend of 20 years, he, he came to work with me in 2014, and uh, we're still doing it now. Um, we take the art out to people. Uh, I'll talk international in just a second, but being based in the UK, where probably 65, 70% of all my sales are based, it, what I've discovered very early on is that you can't make a decision very rarely make a decision on a big piece of art without seeing it in your space so all i'm doing really is satisfying a need now i know if i've got a giant wall space behind my sofa or i just extended and got a you know something in a, an atrium or a double height ceiling or something like that and i'm looking for a piece of art to go in it there's no way i'm going to shell out multiple thousands of pounds unless i see it so I figured, well, how difficult would this be? And actually, you buy a van and you put the service up online, I'll bring it to your house. It's as simple as that. And, and that was one of the key things in this working because actually what I've done is made it very easy. The hardest thing anyone's got to do is decide which one they like, and that's it. I literally have taken the hassle away. So we do all the moving and everything. We do it on spec so it doesn't place anybody under any obligation. I don't have to pay anything. If they hate me, they could kick me out of the door. I don't care. But the most important thing is I'm giving with that service the flexibility and the, the relaxation of being known that actually I'll do it for you. If you like it, great. And if you don't, don't worry about it. And it's a similar thing for internationals. It has to be right. you know, done on an individual basis. But I've even flown away with two or three pieces and done the same, you know, in America and sing I do some stuff to Singapore, we've done Dubai. And we'll do the same again because here's the really crucial thing here, Malcolm. By the time you have a dialogue with a potential client mm. at that point, you know that they're pretty serious that they like what you do. So 
really there are no barriers at that point. It's just a question of what's going to be right for them. And actually, that's the whole point. We have to make sure what they're doing is right. I would never stitch anybody up. I'd rather be honest with them. The other thing I do, uh, as far as one of the service things is, uh, I use the beauty of Photoshop. So, so I, can, I can use software. I'll take a yes. photo from somebody's phone and whatever images or sorry, whatever paintings they're interested in, I'll then use Photoshop to place it on the wall into their room settings. So you send it back to the client. The client opens their inbox, and there is a picture of their wall with the paintings they like. So they can instantly see, oh, that black one, gold one, looks quite nice, or I'm not too sure about the red and green one. So even before you've met with somebody, you're helping to manage their decision process. And that is brilliant. And I'd say probably nine out of ten people send me their photos and absolutely love it. Um, but, you know, that, that means I don't even have to move away from my desk. It doesn't take very long, but I'm just using the powers of software and technology. So, you know, I haven't gone into virtual reality or anything like that yet, but this tech has been around for 20 years. Use it, and it works really well. Exactly. The software has been around, um, but there are actually very few artists that are making the extra effort. That, that's an important message. Um, you've, got to, you've got to make the effort and you've got to put in the work. That's the key, isn't it, for success, whether you're an artist or fixing cars. You've got to do the extra bit of work. And people... Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I talk on the videos uh, on the YouTube channel about uh, relentlessness. There's some good keywords I have. Um, effort is one. Uh, graft is another one. They're all strong words, but they are all key to doing this. You know, there are no secrets to anything that I am doing. All it is, is sheer determination and bloody mindedness. I won't give up. And if I've got a problem, I solve it. Um, and you're right, you have to go the extra mile because otherwise you never become memorable. One, I had a very, very good piece of advice from someone right when I started doing this. And she was an artist that I, I met in my very first studio next door to me. And she said, just do something every day. If you do something every day, think after 365 days how much better you become. And that's literally the principle I've operated on from day one. Do something every day. Doesn't matter what, do something. But it's consistency that wins the day. Um, so that, that's all it is, is really, I think. And yes, you've hit, you've hit the point absolutely on the head. You've got to put the effort in. If you don't want to put the effort in, continue paying a gallery. It's as simple as that. One of your um, things that you do, you mentioned international deliveries and international clients, but uh, you've created some incredible projects and one stuck when I was looking through your website um, and you visited uh, the Hamptons in the US. I mean, it's it sounds like an absolute dream. I had a um, um, client get in touch uh, who uh, runs an investment company and uh, said, you know, we, we've got a place out in the Hamptons. We, we really like your work. Um, what can you do for us? So I, I actually flew over there on spec and said, met him and said, right, let's go and have a look and see what we can do. So, so I went out to his house and um, uh, we had a measure up and discussed stuff. I flew back and um, put a price together for him and said, this is how much it's going to cost. Do you want to have a go? And he said, yeah, go and have a go, see what you come up with. So it's very, as, as laid back as that. Um, so that's exactly what I did, and uh, him and his wife picked out, was it four? I think it was four, maybe five, I can't remember, probably four, five, maybe six. It's <laughs> testing my memory now. It was certainly four, anyway, pretty big painting. And um, with Adrian, we uh, we shipped them out there, and uh, there was three feet of snow at JFK. We didn't even know if we'd make the flight, and uh, the, the crate got lost, and uh, it was just an absolute logistical nightmare from start to finish. But we arrived on the day that I said we'd be there, at 11 a.m., and the crate arrived at 11 a.m. after about 48 hours of phone calls. And we put them on the wall, in, and we got them all stretched around the frames and uh, put up in about seven hours. And um, it, it was one of the most memorable times I think we've ever had. I mean, it was cutting it close, and logistically, it was a nightmare. But we did exactly what we said we would do to the minute, and that's it. That's all the client wants. client hasn't got time to rush around worrying where we are or answer phone calls. He demands that the, the art be put on there when I say it is. So it doesn't matter where it is, the time of day or night, we do it. We just get it done. And I think that's, that's it was a really good one. We've had some great projects, but yes, that, that, is, that was a particular highlight, that one. Your YouTube channel, let's turn to that. Um, it's a fabulous place to see 
how you go about your work and your workspace and your amazing um, studio. You've been doing a lot of live broadcasts as well, live YouTube broadcasts. You know, I can only describe them as um, very slick production. <laughs> There's so much that I could see that could possibly go wrong, but you, you pull it off. Um, tell us a little bit about how you've set up your um, live streams and and the challenges you've had there. It's a, it, it does take a hell of a lot of time. I mean, we broadcast uh, at 7.30 p.m. most Wednesdays, uh, London time. And uh, we decided probably about eight, nine months ago that uh, it would be quite fun to, to start broadcasting, uh, try and reach a new audience. I mean, there is a, there is a commercial gain to be had here, or so we thought. It's, it has turned out not to be that case, but um, it's, it's just raving fans and artists and uh, creatives and curious people who, uh, who watch it, which is brilliant. I've never sold anything because of it, but that's not the point. Um, yeah, so I thought, you know, we've, we've, we've got this tech, we've got a YouTube channel, so let's have a part of it that is, is a regular occurrence to try and you know, build an audience to get people to come back every week. Um, the other thing it does, it forces me to paint. So even though, you know, there'll be some times or maybe weeks on end that I don't want to do anything, this pushes me into a corner and says, no, you've got a responsibility. You've promised everybody you're going to do it. So get on and do it. And that's good. We all need to kick up the bum now and again, as we mentioned earlier on. Logistically, oh, dear Lord, where, where, where do I even start? It's, it's, it's four cameras, uh, high def cameras. We've managed to coerce a GoPro into being a first-person cam, so I wear that on a strap uh, with a wireless backpack, uh, which transmits wireless signals from where I am in my contained sealed paint pod out to the control desk where Adrian sits, so I can have proper wireless video feeds. We've done the same with the audio. and managed to isolate the noise of the extraction unit, so you can just hear me through my breathing masks. That in itself has been a, a, a complete nightmare to get right. Um, we've also had to look at things like broadcasting rates, um, how, how to sync up the streams, how to do it across multiple platforms. We're always struggling with tech, like mi mixing the microphone and audio signals, putting in the special effects, queuing in other videos that we've made to go within that, uh, keeping everything to a rough kind of time scale, how to feed the chat inside to where I'm painting so I can stop and chat to people. And then, of course, I have to talk to Adrian outside. So we've got a two-way comm system that's closed circuit. Oh, do you know what? It just goes on and on and on and on. And really, everything is yeah. pushed against us to stop us from doing it. And yet still, we manage every week for around about an hour to do a painting from start to finish. And everybody has fun. I mean, it really is. When I say this, and I mean this in all sincerity, it's the best time of the week for us out of any week. It is the best fun. Stressful as hell but the best fun we could ever have. It is unique, Ed. <laughs> and everyone needs to see you doing your, your live videos. And if anyone hasn't seen it, picture you in this pod unit. You, you're using all these toxic paints, etc. So you've got a, the mask on and alone in this little habitat pod of yours as well. If that's uh, not a big enough challenge as it is, you, you're broadcasting and all those cameras and everything. So the mind boggles, but you've pulled it off and uh, a good show. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I thought I was quite a busy fellow, but your work ethic is amazing. Was this something that you've learned along the way? Have you always been like this, uh, a driven kind of person? Um, I, I think so, yeah. I, I, I think it's just an application of mind, really, that no matter what situation I'm in, I always seem to have to, I seem to have to work very hard to accomplish anything, let's let, put it that way. So back in my retail career, I think I was awful in a, as a, in a retail career as a manager. Uh, I, I just was a round peg in a square hole. So to even get to, to functioning, I had to, to just to work very, very hard. And that's probably where where this ethic was forged, I knew that it probably wasn't the right career path, but because I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, I kind of stayed with it. But in order to stop myself from sinking without a trace and getting fired on numerous occasions, I had to put ridiculous amounts of work in. And I think that's probably where it all came from. And since then, I, I've just, just adopted that as being, this is the way you do it. If you do something, um, I know it's a cliche, but you do it to the best of your ability. Otherwise, what's the point? If you if you go into something half-arsed, then you deserve a half-arsed uh, outcome. So if you absolutely put everything you can into it, no matter what gives, 
you can look yourself in the mirror and say, well, couldn't have done any more. And I think there's a broad life principle in there as well. You know, we've only got a finite amount of time available to us, haven't we? And uh, do you want to make it count or, or not? I, I try and make it count as much as possible. It'll probably kill me in the process, but uh, I, I'm prepared for that. That's okay. I'd rather have lived a life that's as full and as interesting and as, you know, up and down as I can make it than just flatline until I'm 105. I just couldn't bear that. So I, that, that, I think that's my principle, but that's probably where it came from. Do you have any particular routines, uh, habits, uh, a morning routine, meditation, any, anything like that? No. <laughs> well, actually, yes. <laughs> just, just one. Um, I, I always have eggs in some way, shape or form for breakfast. So uh, I, I, um, I like scrambled eggs on toast. That's, uh, that's very nice. Occasionally, I get all, all up myself and have an avocado and uh, <clears throat> join the elite. Uh, but most of the time, it's just, just some scrambled eggs on toast and a coffee. You must always have a coffee every morning. I'm a complete caffeine addict. It's great. But uh, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing else in yeah, not, nothing else in terms of a routine. No, I don't. I don't meditate. I don't. Uh, you know, I don't stretch. I don't go for a five mile run. I don't sit and watch uh, repeats of Brooklyn Nine Nine. I don't have any kind of. Uh, oh, that's a great program. I don't have any kind of uh, um, repetitive thing except for eggs and coffee. That's a good start to the day, and I will go from there. Yeah, most important meal of the day. Eh? When you are taking it easy, let's. Uh, I'm not sure what when you relax or take time off. Um, what do you say about books or movies? Which do you prefer? T time off? Time off? What, what is this time off you speak of? I, I am not familiar with the concept. Okay, okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> on, on the rare occasion, I find myself twiddling my thumbs out of either sheer exhaustion or, um, or utter defiance. Then, um, well, I do like climbing, I must admit. I very much like climbing. I, again, I discovered that quite by accident last year. So I'm, I'm really, really terrible at it. I've got no upper body strength, so I'm just trying to do that. And that's a real good switch off for me, and a good um, it, it's it's a good focus, you know, when you when you think, oh, I'm going to fall off this rock and die. It's surprising just how uh, calm you can become. So so that's good. Do I switch off and do movies? Yeah, quite like movies. I don't really read any books. Occasional copies of New Scientist. I think if I had my time again, I'm a closet geek, so I'd probably be uh, studying for uh, you know degree in something or other, and uh, going to work at CERN because that's that stuff just utterly fascinates me. But, um, yeah, in terms of books, can't really recommend anything. But um, uh, I do enjoy sci-fi. is great. Love sci-fi movies. Not into horror. A um, few action adventures. Comedy is pretty good. But definitely definitely a sci-fi freak. I, I love anything like that. Okay. Sci-fi movie, greatest one you've ever seen. Um, okay. Sci-fi. I've got to be honest that uh, Interstellar was very good from a few years ago with Matthew McConaughey just because it was – probably as factually accurate in terms of our understanding of things at the time. And uh, so I thought that was pretty good. I love Contact uh, with, um, um, oh, what, jo Jody, can't remember her name. Oh, help me out. Jody, Jody Foster. Jody Foster, thanks ever so much. Yeah, my memory's not what it was. Contact's great. 2001 A Space Odyssey, which broke so many moulds for me. I mean, I can't remember when I saw that. I was about eight years old, and I was literally comatose for three days after watching that. Um, so some great ones out there. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, if, if I was left on a desert island and could only take one DVD with me, it would be the, 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 the Matrix. I'd definitely take the Matrix with me. Well, I was going to ask you um, if you have any particular health routines or um, physical fitness or how do you keep in shape. I'm not quite sure those are relevant anymore, Ed, but uh, if you if you have any tips there. It's a tricky one. I, I go through phases. Uh, you know, I went through a phase last year. I lost some weight and I was exercising at the gym and, you know, getting myself a bit more lean and keen. And, uh, you know, so I could really sort of start up the martial arts again. And then uh, I discovered uh, uh, the pizza shop opened down the road from me and then it all just got piled back on. And now I look like a sack of potatoes. So um, I, I think it all comes in fits and starts. Uh, I, I don't really, I'm, I'm terrible with routine. There are some routines I stick to, obviously eggs and coffee, like you mentioned. But there are most of the other routines I'm notoriously bad at. I'm, I have so, apart from work, all my other life disciplines are pretty terrible. I don't, I just literally can't follow anything. So I just go from bounce from one thing to another. I get fat, I get thin, I get fit, I get unfit. And it's probably just bounce around like that for the rest of my life. <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> I've just got a bike uh, for the first time in about five years. So that's good. Enjoying riding the bike. 
Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's about. I'm sure that will probably get put on eBay in about six months when I'll try and find something else. So I don't know. Maybe I just can't settle on anything for long enough. I, I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's great when you when your work is your joy and your passion as well. So yeah, I definitely can relate to that. I want to just touch on your gallery. We we haven't really spoken too much about it, but it is an exceptional gallery and exceptional space tell us uh, a little bit about it um how long have you been in that particular space where you where you at now so <clears throat> i got the the current studio space in 2012 uh signed a big lease for three years without really as i've said earlier any money to to pay for it uh, it, it was pretty derelict when i got it. it was an old woodworking shop none of the lights worked there were holes in the ceiling the floor was a disgrace uh, it was it was relatively cheap for what it was, even though it was a big space, and it took me quite a while to find it. I really only started to turn it into what can be called a gallery or show space, um, as the, the amount of work that I'd got started to grow. Now, okay, yes, there's plenty of room in there, but as time went on, I wanted to think, do you know what? What? I wonder if I could start hanging these, because they were all pretty much sat on the floor. And there's one thing that my paintings don't like, it's being sat on the floor, because the weight of the paint starts to... Uh, pull everything downwards towards the floor you know gravity takes effect everything becomes wobbly and floppy and before you know you got cracks in the paint so mm. it kind of was born out of a necessity of need to get the paintings hung so i came chatting to adrian one night and i said right he, he just finished work as, as he was a plumber at the time how are we going to build this what can we do can i put walls up and literally just start hanging some of this stuff so it's not now sat on the floor uh, compressed under its own weight. So we, we sketched a rough idea and um, I bought some cheap timbers and some plasterboard, drywall as I, th I think it's called in the States, and started just putting some very crude wall sections up um, and then just putting the paintings onto that. So over the next, I don't know, three to six months, I started just putting walls up. And as you put one wall up and paint it white and you think, oh, that looks really nice, you put another one up and another one up and another one up and you sell a few paintings and you put some more money into it. So over the course of, I think, probably three years it took, we converted the space from literally the most derelict, horrid place on the planet to what you can see today, which is a bright, comfortable, well-lit space full of air and light and energy. Uh, so really what I've done is just plow back um, money as, as I've taken money and put revenue back into it to, to produce the space. And... What's really good, and I didn't realize this at the time, I'd like to say that I did, but I certainly didn't, is that actually now when I, when I post the pictures of it on the site, it puts everything into context. Now, although I am not a commercial gallery, all I am is an art studio with my own show space, if you want to give it that label instead. Um, it adds a lot of weight to what I'm doing on the site because it gives a central point for people to come and have a look at what I do. And, you know, I'm a real person, I'm a real business, I've got a great big space, I've got all the associated costs of doing that, so I'm real, I'm not going anywhere, I'm successful at doing what I'm doing. And actually when people can, potential clients can see this, it, it, it gives them some reassurance that they can actually come and see this stuff for real. You know, it's not just a picture on the internet, it actually exists, it's real, so am I, one phone call later, and you can be walking around the gallery with a coffee that I've just made for you. And I think that's really, really important. Bricks and mortar is great if you can do it. I know not everybody can. But, you know, I, I, I searched for this space for well over two years, and I've invested ridiculous amounts of time with, with Adrian, my friend, into it. And this is the result. So it goes back to what you're saying. If you're prepared to put the work in, this is what you can get out of it. It certainly helps to have that uh, physical presence where a collector can stand in front of the painting and admire it and fall in love with it. So that is a, that's a huge plus and, and perhaps some motivation um, or use the money you're saving on gallery commissions and invest it in your own space. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm quite happy to admit I've never ever took, I've only ever taken, well, probably less than an average UK wage since I first did this. You know, there's no preconception that, you know, I have a massive house and drive a Lamborghini. I, I don't, I've got a, I, got, I own a Mini. And uh, but I've kept anything that I make, I keep inside my business. I have enough to live and make sure Adrian has enough to do the same. 
and everything gets put back into what I'm doing. And I continually, continually reinvest back into it. And that's been a real key for me because it's kept me going through the difficult times and it's helped me push when the times are better. Um, so it's, it's, that's my model for success. It's, it's okay to do what you're doing, but if you have a small period where you do very well, sit on that and don't let it go because you're going to need that. You're absolutely going to need every single penny that you take. Yeah. And reinvestment is, is, is the way forward for me. Yes, absolutely. And, and right now, as we are all sitting under lockdown, I think that lesson is uh, it's certainly going to resonate. But uh, when people can get out and about again, where can they find your gallery, Ed? Right. Well, well, I guess the first sort of call of call is uh, is on the website, which is uh, suarez.co.uk. That's S W A R E Z dot co dot uh, You can find me on any social media platform, including TikTok, and uh, just search for Suarez Art, all one word. So it's Suarez with the word art after it. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Goodness me, you literally are have to be everywhere these days. Fortunately, I am, so you can find me there. But it's the website that contains the bulk of everything that you'd ever need to know. For anyone who wants to come visit me, they are more than welcome. I'd urge you probably just drop me a line in advance because as a working artist, I may not be there. I might be out with a client or knee-deep in paint or trying to do my accounts or something like that. And as a matter of courtesy, I like to extend uh, uh, time to anyone who steps, steps through the door, give them my time and uh, take them for the tour, show them everything they want to see, whether they're buying or not. Makes no odds. You want to come and have a look? Come and have a look. So I'm based in Stroud in the UK. You can find details at the bottom of every web page on the site. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. My phone number's there. My email's there. There's no barriers. Call me, mail me, whenever you want, 24-7. We're all here for the same thing. Anyone wants to come and have a look, they're more than welcome. I hope people are going to start making appointments right now. <laughs> that, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Get in line. And... Uh, your YouTube channel, it's called? The Suarez. Um, so that's all one word, The Suarez. And uh, yes, you can find we're, we're, we've, we've come from nothing. I think we started nine months ago. I've been on YouTube for quite a long time, but didn't do anything. And we first really started attacking this about uh, eight, nine months ago with about 10 subscribers. We, we're almost at 20,000, which, uh, which is really good growth for us, you know, producing what is quite niche content. And um, I just want to say we're actually going to be doing a big giveaway in the next four weeks. Uh, we're launching a video in the next couple of days, which is our 20,000 subscriber giveaway. And uh, I'm doing exactly that. Anyone can enter from anywhere on the planet to win one of two paintings. So that's a genuine offer to give something back to everyone who's subscribed and supported us over the last six, seven, eight months. So we're going to give something back. So I'm really happy to announce that. Can't wait to get the video out there. Fabulous. Oh, can't wait. I'll be watching that as well. Well, Ed, all I can say is uh, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. I think your story is not only inspirational, but it is going to get a lot of people, maybe a lot of artists for sure, to relook at their business and give it a real go. And hopefully many collectors are going to be having one of your original works on their wall pretty soon. Well, that would be that would be very nice, and uh, and yeah, th thanks for the invite to do the podcast. I um, although I do have a big mouth and a lot to say and talk at three hundred miles an hour, I hope there are uh, a few practical snippets in there that some people can take, uh, you know, to move themselves forward. That's all we're trying to do. I'm trying to do the same every day. I'm nowhere near where I want to be, but you know, we sometimes you've got to look back at where you've come from instead of keep looking forward all the time. So I do hope that this does give a few people. Uh, a few little golden nuggets. It'd be great to hear that about, and that's the case anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll check up again in a few years' time, Ed, and you can you can look back and see how much you've done because I think <laughs> you're going to be very busy. <laughs> that's the hope. For, for a long, long time. That's great. Thank you very much, Malcolm. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Ed, and uh, we'll chat again hopefully soon. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. I want to give a big thanks to Ed of Suarez Art for appearing on the show today. I'm sure you will agree, really interesting story and inspiration and just to hear the journey that another artist has undertaken to fulfill his dreams 
and to make his art business successful and to experience the joy of creating especially at this time of our lives as well and in the world in general where you may want to question what's the point of putting in a solid day's work well i think uh, listening to it telling us his story it pretty much sums it all up you get out what you put in we're only here for a limited time so let's make the most of it and uh, create your own fun create your own joy create your own pleasures don't wait around for somebody else just do one thing every day you'll be amazed with what you can achieve Please make a note of visiting suarez.co.uk and uh, also pop into Suarez Arts blog. Some really amusing uh, stories there as well. And uh, clearly Ed has a wicked sense of humor. Also, make sure that you visit uh, Suarez Art on YouTube. Check out the amazing videos and live streams and uh, give Suarez Art your support as well. We're all in this together. Give them a like, subscribe and uh, send him a note as well. And if you're lucky enough to be in the vicinity when we all can move around again as normal, pop into his fantastic gallery and check out the amazing art. Also, I want to thank you for joining me on the podcast uh, your support is invaluable if you can give the podcast a like and share it as well maybe leave a review that would be fantastic if you want to find out more about what i get up to visit malcolmdeweyfineart.com check out my gallery as well and any painting courses you're interested in i even have a free short course that you can join no strings attached and uh, we'll share some art together. Okay, well, that's it. So I will see you and you'll hear from me in the next podcast, hopefully very soon. Until then, cheers for now.